Greetings all. Welcome, welcome. My name is Sage Morgan Hubbard and I am a I'm a consultant here at the Anacostia Community Museum working with the fabulous and wonderful Food for the People exhibit um, that is opening this Saturday. So please, please, please come out. It's outdoors and free outside of our Anacostia Community Museum. And we are very excited to have this month's Take Time Thursdays be focused on our year long theme, Our Food, Our Future. This year-long examination of food history, culture, and justice includes the exhibit Food for the People, Eating and Activism in Greater Washington, D.C., and related programs designed to educate and encourage audiences such as yourselves to take action to create a more equitable future. As you know, this is Take Time Thursdays, and with the Anacostia Community Museum, we're here to give you a chance to take the time that you need for wellness, health, and creativity with artists, thought leaders, performers, wellness practitioners, and others. We see this as a 30-minute break for us, right? From 2.30 to 3 p.m each Thursday to boost your mind, body, and spirit. And we are blessed this Thursday with the fabulous Xavier Brown, who is a native of Washington, D.C., and he's a graduate of North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. He operates at the boundaries of urban agricultural, environmental sustainability, and African diasporic culture. His work intertwines a sustainability with the issues that impact structure communities from gun violence to mass incarceration. By studying the practices of indigenous people and going back to ancestral knowledge, Xavier is creating a new sustainability movement that is healing the people and the land by reconnecting our sacred relationship to the earth. Whew, I don't know about y'all, but I am so excited for this um, special talk. So without further ado, I am going to pass the mic to Xavier. Oh, thanks, Sage, um, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for joining us uh, for Take Time Thursday. I'm excited to be here. I put together um, a fun presentation just to give you all an overview of um, kind of one of the many projects that, I, that I've kind of been able to participate in, a community-led project. It's about a hot sauce called the Pippin Sauce. And I just want to give you all an overview of the beautiful experience and the beautiful journey um, that is um, and the collective journey that has, been, that has been to kind of put the sauce together. So I'm going to share my screen and kind of like lead you all on this uh, 15 to 20 minute um, kind of one run through of kind of my thoughts along the process. Give me one second. Cool. Um, so the name of this presentation is Too Much Sauce. Yeah. So like before we start, I just want to kind of dedicate it to a young guy, um, this guy right here who my curse is on, and Kareem Palmer, he was murdered last year. But he was one of the um, original young people that I've been working with at least for like the last five years. He and his mother and his brother right here, Mikhail, and some of his other brothers came out to um, the Eastern Shore of Maryland where myself and some of my other friends were put on these large uh, black farmer retreats and stuff like that. And I recruited him and hired him to help me make the sauce. And he would go with me to different places to kind of make the sauce. And so I definitely want to just kind of honor his memory and we'll revisit that towards the end of the presentation. So to kind of start off, all of my work around agriculture is, is the basis of it is framed from this standpoint, which is Afroecology. So I'm a member of the Black Deer Farm Collective. It's a, it's a returning generation uh, Black farmer collective of young, I guess youngish Black folks getting back into land, getting back into agriculture. And through our kind of collective development, we came up with uh, a definition of the way that we see the world, the way that we operate and the things that we're trying to shift. So I'll read this for everybody briefly. So Afroecology is a form of art, movement, practice, and process of social and ecological transformation that involves the reevaluation of our sacred relationships with land, water, air, seeds, and food. 
we recognize as humans as co-creators that are at the aspect that are an aspect of the planet's life support systems values the Afro-Indigenous experience of reality and the ways of knowing, cherishes ancestral and communal forms of knowledge, experience and life ways that began in Africa and continue throughout the diaspora and is rooted in the agrarian traditions, legacies and struggles of the black experience in the Americas. So I thought this is a great place to start because being a part of the Black Dirt Farm Collective, I was also part of a Seed Keepers Collective of Color. I was also part of a Seed Keepers Collective of Color. And um, through that Seed Keepers Collective, we would trade seeds. I would meet a, a bunch of different um, kind of well-known, uh, but primarily Black um, and Latinx urban farmers from up and down the Mid-Atlantic. And one thing that we would do is we, we would trade seeds and we would share stories. And I was fortunate enough to get a variety of uh, chili pepper seeds called the horse, pip, and fish pepper seeds. And through time, I started to do research and started to hear stories read anecdotes um, and articles about this guy right here, whose name is Horace Pippin. Um, and outside of his, his um, what he did for agriculture and just seed keeping, he was, all, he was, a, he was a soldier and he was a, a world renowned painter. And so this is just like some brief information about Horace Pippin. He was born in 1888 in uh, Chester, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philly. He fought in World War I um, with the Harlem Hellfighters and the Harlem Hellfighters uh, you know, fought the longest, uh, like over a hundred days in the trenches over in France, you know, and they were, well, they were revered, well-renowned, but even, you know, back in those days, when they came back to the United States, you know, they were looked down on, spit on, you know, they were treated, you know, how black people were treated um, during that time period. During World War One, he was shot in his arm and he taught himself how to paint. So he became a painter. And I, I, I personally believe that he used painting as a way to, um, Heal from the PTSD from just white supremacy in the United States, but also the PTSD from uh, from being a soldier and fighting and just just the 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 the, the craziness of battle. Um, and another highlight at the end that I'll dive deeper into is that he traded some seeds to this guy named H.R. Weaver, you know, for bee stings. So this is just a you know a quick glance at the the history of Horace Pippen. And um, one of the reasons why I wanted to keep his legacy alive, and I named the hot sauce after Horace Pippen, is called the Pippen sauce. And so these are just some examples of his artwork. And a lot of his artwork is almost, it's like telling his story or his viewpoint of, of the world, you know, from his standpoint of being um, a black veteran, being a, a, a black veteran during uh, the Jim Crow era, during segregation, during all these different types of things. Um, and you can see, you know, one picture has the uh, clan mask, one picture is in, in the trenches. Um, another picture looks like they're, you know, they're in their sleeping quarters. And so really just talking about, you know, what's going on in the world from his perspective. Cool. And so kind of jump into the story. So as a seed keeper, the importance of the difference between seed keeping and seed saving is that seed keepers hold on to the history and the legacy of the seeds, right? So all of us, everybody that's on this present, you know, that's a part of the Zoom right now, is attached to certain foods that represent their culture, that represent where they come from, whether your mom made, your grandma made, or your great grandma, grandpa, somebody kind of in your ancestry and your family made. All of those foods, no matter what it is, is connected to some story. It's connected to a seed. It has to be grown by some farmer somewhere. And so the importance of being a seed keeper is that we hold on to those histories. We hold on to those histories of those seeds. And we hold those stories and we pass those stories along, right? So we hold on to that legacy. And I felt like, you know, for me, um, being an African-American, there's not too many pepper seeds that you get. There's, there's, there's a tons of, of peppers that are coming from the Caribbean. There's tons of peppers that are coming from different parts of West Africa. There's, different, there's a tons of peppers that are coming from Latin, parts of Latin America. But there's not too many peppers that you're getting that are coming from uh, North America, that are tied to the African-American experience. And so I wanted to kind of hold that legacy up high and figure out a way to kind of share that. And so I'm gonna share with you all the story, you know, that was passed on to me about the, the, the kind of the famous uh, fish pepper seeds. So Horace Pippen, you know, po post-World War I, he was a painter. He was shot in his arm, like I mentioned. There was a remedy, uh, you know, he was having, he had numbness in his hand. He was losing feeling in his hand. And there was a, a remedy at that time that if you stuck your hand in a beehive that you would kind of revive, you know, the feeling 
in your hand and kind of bring back the feeling, the sensation back in your hand. So this guy right here on the, um, put my cursor on him on the far left, this is H.R. Weaver. Um, he and Pippa knew each other. They lived in the same kind of Philadelphia region. Weaver was a seed keeper, you know, gardener. And these, these two guys were, you know, I guess from what I could tell, they were friends. And so Pippin approached Weaver one day and was like, hey, I'll give you these rare, you know, pepper seeds if you let me stick your hand in the beehive. And, you know, Weaver, obviously, obviously you know, as, as a beekeeper, as having bees as a gardener, he's hesitant to make this trade because he's like, he's basically like, you know, bro, if, you know, if you stick your hand in my beehive and the bees sting you, you, you know, you can potentially destroy my, my hive, my colony, what I have going on right now. And so... I'm assuming that Weaver or, or Pippin was able to kind of sweeten up the deal and give him some more seeds. So there's outside of the fish pepper seeds that I utilize for my sauce, there's at least three or four other varieties, Brana Mulata, there's a honey pepper seed. There's like three or four other varieties of pepper seeds that are um, can be traced back to Horace Pippin and Weaver, like their, their connection. So I, I would assume that he, he made a nice little kind of uh, seed bundle or seed pouch form and they made the swap, right? So the older weaver, um, you know, ends up passing on transitions, transitions on, they both do to the next realm. And we have this guy right here, who's William Wars Weaver. So uh, this is the grandson of HR. William Wars Weaver and his family are cleaning out the, uh, the refrigerator out of his grandfather's house. And he finds these, uh, he's cleaning the refrigerator and he finds this case of seeds that are called like the Pippin seeds, right? And he does his research and uh, William Moore's Weaver, if you were to look him up right now, he's kind of a world renowned seed keeper. He has seeds from all over the world. A lot of kind of amazing varieties of seeds that, that kind of be kind of be, you know, traced back to him and him saving them and, and passing them out to grow them, grow them, grow them, you know, to keep the genetics and the, and the, uh, the seed strains alive. And so Weaver, you know, finds these seeds and he gives them out to uh, farmers in his local area and helps to bring back the um, bring back the fish pepper because the fish pepper for you know one thing that I've learned over time that older farmers have taught me is that the only way that you can keep or save seeds is if you grow them. So this came to a, a point where African Americans kind of moved off the land, people stopped gardening, um, you know things industries were changing and all of that nature. And so people stopped growing the fish pepper. And so to a certain point, it, it kind of went extinct because if nobody's growing it, there's no more seeds. And so he was one of the people that helped to kind of revive it. And so fortunately enough for me, um, being a part of that Seed Keepers Collective, there was a guy named Owen Taylor who was William Ward's Weaver's apprentice. And so Owen and I were friends. And so Owen gifted me some seeds. I took those seeds back with me to uh, Southeast DC and I grew them out. I grew as kind of as many as I had at that time. I grew a bunch of them and they did um, amazingly well. They did very, very well. And I had an abundance of seeds. Oh, we'll hold off on. So I had an abundance of seeds. Um, kind of running parallel to that time period, I was also going up to Baltimore County, a little bit north of Baltimore, to this farm called Five Seeds Farm. And I used to go up there with some other of my friends, and, and it was a group of us, kind of young Black folks going up there. This guy named Denzel Mitchell was the first person that I, Owen was the first person to give me the seeds. Denzel Mitchell was the first person I, I'd ever seen grow the seeds and learn more about like, the cultivation process of the fish pepper plant. So we would go up to, you know, up to Baltimore County, and grow the seeds and just learn and vision and, and play around, bounce ideas off of each other. And so all of this is going on at the same time. And so when I had my harvest of fish peppers, I was trying to figure out, you know, man, I have like 20 pounds of peppers, you know, what am I going to do with 20, 20 pounds of, uh, not too many people in the DC knew about the, the, the chili pepper, the fish pepper. So I couldn't sell it. I probably couldn't give them away, all of them. And so I was fortunate enough, this elder um, that I'm connected with, she gave me one of the uh, ball mason jar. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with ball mason jar, the brand. They make a, a book, like a catalog of like recipes and stuff like that. So she gave me a, um, a steam canner and the ball mason jar magazine. And I was staying up all night, like making pepper jelly and just playing around, playing around, making pepper jelly with experiments. And I was just playing around. And so I finally, you know, created a, a, a recipe that I felt confident about 
And this is around, so the harvest of the fish pepper is towards, it's like in the burr month. So, you know, all, maybe late August, September, October, for sure, you're getting a bunch of peppers. So I was giving this out as like a, as a gift around um, the holiday season, just to, hey, just to tell some of my friends in the neighborhood that I know across the city of PG County, you know, check this out, you know, let me know what you think, let me know what you think. And people are like, hey, Xavier, my, my friends call me X, They're like, hey, X, man, this is good, you should sell this, you should sell this. I was like, okay, you think so? So they were kind of um, boosting my confidence and hyping my head up. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try to sell it. So at that time period, I was I was just following the uh, ball mason jar recipe. And I was making pepper jelly at that time. This is long before I had the idea of making hot sauce and creating my own recipe. And so as time went on, um, I, you know, I was just doing some thinking and, and people watching and and um, just trying to pay attention to, 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 to cultural no norms of like food and just food culture. And I realized that, you know, between, just since I had made the sauce so many times, I realized that there was a, a, you know, you change one or two ingredients and it goes from pepper jelly to the sauce. And, you know, culturally, you know, um, people just around the world have more of a, a, an attachment to sauces than they do uh, pepper jellies. And so, you know, there's people who have like their own, like they swear and live by like Texas Pete or something like that, or tiger sauce, and they might carry it in their bag or they might, you know, only use this. And pepper jelly, not so much, you know, people use the jelly on crackers, they might use it on a, on a uh, bagel or a piece of toast or something like that. But jelly, you know, it's, it's in your fridge and it's kind of there for a long time. And so I figured, hey, I'm, I'm going to try to make some hot sauce. And so, but I wanted to kind of make a hot sauce that represented me, the, my culture, that represented Afroecology, that represented like um, DC and returning generation uh, black gardeners and farmers. And so I felt like the first way to do that was to develop a label that stood out. And so this is, a, I actually had a friend of mine that went to school with me, undergrad with me. Uh, she made this label for me. And this label, um, I felt that it represents, it represented DC, it represented um, some of the things that I was into, it had uh, some Adinkra symbols from uh, West Africa, Ghana, West Africa, it had, uh, you know, some dice on there, it had Aggie Pride, represents the school I went to, all these different things. And I wanted to be able to, when I explain it to folks, I'm not going to go, we don't have the time to decode or decipher the label now, but I wanted to, it to be able to like tell a story. And for me, um, I, I was, you know, as a youth, I always grew up like listening to rap music. And one thing I always enjoyed about rap music was like the labels on the CD. I, grew, I was like in the CD era when the CD, when you get a new album, you know, some albums will always have like different meanings behind them or they were always like works of art. You know, you always kind of remember like that album cover. And so I wanted this to be like similar to that where you're like staring at it, trying to figure out what it meant. And then you had the opportunity to kind of research different things, but oh man, this is what no culture without agriculture means. Or this is what dope jam means, et cetera, et cetera. So that was like the beginning of the process with the label. And so kind of continuing to go forward, I took um, my homegirl, Casey, took that label and moved it over to, this is literally like the 2021 version of the label. And we went through multiple iterations of this label, but this is like the 2021 version of the label. So we were able to kind of compress all of that and put it onto this. And, um, you know, we put, you know, last year after Kareem uh, passed, we added the uh, long live ream on there because we definitely want to um, keep his legacy alive. And we also connecting history through flavors. I'll kind of explain what that means. But um, just to tell the story, some of the story of like, you know, you're not going to get any hot sauce. I don't think you'll get any hot sauce literally in the world where some of the peppers are grown in Clay Terrace, DC, or some of the peppers are, gr peppers are grown on, um, on, on this uh, farm called Mount Pleasant Acres Farm in the Eastern Shore of Maryland, you know. So I really wanted to bring out the growers, and I wanted to highlight the growers um, that were part of it. So this is like the current label, and the process of of the uh, of the peppers is is what I'm most proud of. And so, being someone who is growing food and vegetables within D.C., uh, I realized very quickly that I didn't have that much space. Like my space was limited. I would go out to the rural areas and they would have two, three, four, five acres. And I'm back in DC and I'm working with like a quarter of an acre, if that, right? So I'm trying to figure out, 
you know, how can I make this work while still, uh, you know, how can I make it work, the space that I have? And so a mentor of mine, you know, sent me an article about some folks in New York that had a very interested, interesting process of like how they, they were able to collectively um, grow peppers or and grow food. And I figured, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I consider myself a cool guy and, and somebody who's respected. So I figured that if I, I had a proposition for some of my, my friends, my black grower friends, you know, they would be interested in it. And so essentially what we do with the sauce is we save the seeds from every year. We try to save this maybe like two to 3,000 seeds. Um, we, you know, rinse them, wash them, let them dry, and we store them. And every season, we uh, send them out to this farm in, in, I guess that's, that might be like Montgomery County, Maryland, where, you know, one of the main things they do is start up seedlings. So we get between 1,500 and 2,000 seeds started up every year. You know, I talk to different folks, kind of my different friends in D.C., P.G., and Baltimore. I'm like, yo, um, if you're willing to kind of grow these peppers for me, I'll buy back whatever you grow. You know, and since we're making sauce, it really doesn't matter, you know, visually how the peppers look, as long as they were grown um, in, in natural conditions, organic conditions, and they were harvested, um, you know, in, in a safe way. So, and, you know, what I would do, is we'll pay them, you know, you know, top dollar, you know, per pound for the peppers. And what we do is we try to figure out creative ways to highlight the growers of these different batches of sauce. And so, so people can have a direct connection with the people who grow their sauce. And we pride ourselves with working with, at this point, we're like 99%, like all the peppers are grown by black growers and to be able to tell their stories um, and to still tell these new generational stories of people who are returning to the land. Um, whether you're a farmer or a gardener or whatever kind of adjective that you use to kind of describe the scale that you're growing on, I think it's important to kind of share these stories. A lot of these stories are relatable. And I think it's also important to build out these processes that don't have us working in silos, right? Nature doesn't work in silos. So why should our business model work in silos? Um, and so that's kind of the process. This is just, this is Dom and this is Violet. And these are some older pictures. Um, but uh, these are two folks kind of getting peppers. And this uh, picture on the left is, I don't know, this might be like 500 peppers that, uh, that we have that I had to kind of fit in my car and bring them back to the city and kind of distribute to everybody. And so we work with people all over the city, Baltimore and PG County. And this year, um, this is probably like year four, we're gonna do the same thing again. And every year we've been kind of tweaking and refining the process and improving the process and learning as we go. And, and things of that nature. So, so this is just a, uh, ah, this is perfect. So learning as you go. So one of the things that I learned very fast back in like 2019 is that, you know, when you want to grow more peppers, you want to scale up, you want to do more, that, that means everything else has to increase too. And so I was working with some wonderful folks out in Baltimore and they were, they were cranking out the peppers. They were doing like, they, they were, doing some amazing things. And they were giving me like these huge bags of peppers. I'm talking about huge bags, like hundred pound bags of peppers. They were so big. And I was like, dang, you know, you know what I'm gonna do with all these peppers? You know, I'm, I'm excited and, and everything. And I'm trying to figure out where I'm gonna put them. Cause my cold storage that I, I had, uh, my own separate cold storage was full. And so I'm rushing around. I had my, my trunk is full with peppers. It's, you know, I, I don't want them to go bad. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what am I gonna do? So end up pulling back to my house. I'm like, man, you know, um, you know, I, I don't spend that much time in my, at, at my house. I spend a lot of time, at, I'm married now, but my girlfriend's house at the time, I spent a lot of time at her house. So I don't need any of this food that's in the refrigerator. So I just took all the food out of my refrigerator and just like put all the bags of peppers that I could fit in the fridge, like in the refrigerator and cranked up the cold, as cold as it could go. I put all of them like in the freezer that you can't see on this side. This is just a, a thing of learning as you go for anybody who's like in the value added production um, process of whatever, you know, whatever you're making, shea butter or hot sauce or whatever, as you continue, as you feel like you're trying to step up to the next level, make sure that everything else that's a part of your system is at that next level as well. Or you'll run into a process where, you know, people come to your house and they open up your fridge and there's nothing but peppers in there. You'll run into that type of thing. But that's just a um, kind of funny story and just a representation of just, it's just, it's been a learning journey. And so this is the last slide, but this has kind of been the evolution uh, of the sauce. 
And so when I first started, I had a, a green, my colors were like green and red. And I actually honestly cannot remember why it was green. But I eventually, over time, I went, I went to uh, HBCU down in North Carolina called North Carolina A&T and our colors were blue and gold. So I wanted to kind of represent that. And so I wanted to have every single piece of the, of the sauce to have a meaning. And so this is kind of, I thought this was cool because you can see how as you're going through as, as the process moves forward, you can, you know, be flexible enough to make adjustments and make changes and move things around. If things aren't working, don't be afraid to kind of make that change if you have to. And so these are like, this might be like every year or I might make, you know, multiple changes in a year to the sauce or to the bottom or to the labor, the packaging to where finally over here at the far right, this is probably the most recent example that I have a picture of, of like what the sauce currently looks like. I think we've actually changed the bottles. We had to change the bottles in 2020. So we have different bottles now, but just the, it looks more clean and you know, I, I'm proud of the way it looks, but um, that's just been like the evolution of the sauce. I felt like, you know, I guess we, we don't have that much time. So this was a, a quick fun story uh, for anybody who was just interested in knowing more about Horace Pippen or about more about the Pippen sauce or just a brief introduction into um, what kind of value added production could look like. So I'll, um, I'll stop it there. Thank you. That was awesome, Xavier. Okay. Um, we have a bunch of different questions. Um, starting off with where in Southeast did you initially regrow the fish pepper? Yeah, so. Um, was it an existing farm or garden or a newly created space? Yeah, no, it was just, it's this garden called Project Eden. Actually, it was just in the Washington Post last week or two weeks ago. Um, Project Eden is right off of Haley Place and like where MLK and South Capitol intersect. It's off like, I guess that would be MLK and, and Haley Place, but it's in the back of these apartment buildings. And it's a, it's a maybe like a 50 to 75 foot uh, hot tunnel back there. And so I, I work with them a lot. And um, so that was the first place I grew the peppers. And I'll put some down there this year. Um, I'll probably pick up the peppers maybe in like two or three weeks. That's awesome. So we also have questions of how many bottles of sauce are you able to produce each year and where can we get and buy the sauce? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So every year, last year we actually um, produced less bottles than we did in 2019. Um, I made some mistakes on, you know, when you're saving seeds, particularly pepper seeds, peppers have the oil that makes peppers hot is capsicum oil. And also capsicum oil prohibits seeds from, from like being able to grow. Just it prohibits them from, from just sprouting randomly. It's like a safeguard, you know, they have to, um, you have to rinse that off before they'll sprout, right? And so I didn't, we were rushing, making the seeds in 2019. And so we had less peppers that were able, that germinated. And so I had to work with some other farmers and nobody, like all the people that grew peppers for me last year who maybe ha may have had their own um, seedling stock, they didn't have any. My folks in Baltimore who gave me like hundreds of pounds, they said they didn't have any. So I grew more, less peppers, but my, my sauce got in Whole Foods last year. So it was like, I was under like, it was like a, a interesting um, kind of complexity that I ran into. So you can buy the sauce in Whole Foods. In 2019, we probably made like a thousand bottles, 1,500 to a thousand bottles. This year, um, we're looking to hopefully maybe do like 5,000 bottles, I think, and try to keep it as hyper-local as possible. And the goal is to, I kind of want to um, pass off the creation of the sauce to like some younger folks that I'm working with. So the goal is to um, pass that on. So I don't really want to be the person who's making the sauce and making this, the decisions around the sauce for um, too much longer. So I'm trying to like um, train my replacement yeah, I'm trying to figure that out. Great. And another question is, is the business operated as, as a cooperative? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and how is the business so far uh, um, as far as the sauce? Is, is it doing well right now? It sounds like it's doing well. It's, it's doing okay. It's not a cooperative, um, but I, I would want to turn it over to the youth cooperative. I need to, I haven't had the opportunity to like sit down and like figure out what that looks like and I would want to, the young guys that I work with, have them in a position where they feel confident 
just on basic cooperative principles and what that looks like and what that will, will require of them, what they will require of everybody, of myself. So that's where we're headed, but we're not there right now. Currently right now, we just, I had to redo a whole bunch of stuff. So making hot sauce, um, just in the city, in the, it's a whole bunch of other stuff I had to do to be able to make the hot sauce and become like legit. So I had to get like a HACCP plan. I had to take like low acidified food training classes. I had to make it in the commercial kitchen and all the different types of things like that. And so I had to send some stuff to Cornell University so they could test the sauce to make sure that it was at the right pH and it won't, you know, cause botulism. And, and I had to, you know, package it up, get my entire process together and send it to the DC Department of Health. And so right now, um, I think it, I'm going to kind of pass that and become like a super official as far as like my processes. So that's where we are right now. But the sauce, I'm, I wouldn't say, I think we, we're able to turn a profit and we're able to pay all the youth that we work with and we're able to pay all the farmers. Um, so it's not, in order for it to be a, I think a, a large money-making venture, which was never my goal. And I'm, I'm totally happy if it doesn't because it's, it's more about, um, the learning process with the youth and actually making a bunch of money off selling sauce is that I would have to scale it up. I have to like scale up my, the amount um, of peppers that I grow and the amount of uh, bottles that I sell and distribute, which would require like more time of me and, you know, and figuring that out. So um, I think there's other ways to do that, but more importantly than just, like making a bunch of money off sauce is like, infusing the whole process with youth and, and kind of turning it into a, a, a learning tool. So that's kind of, that's where my, like, uh, that's like my win per se for myself. Not necessarily like getting in Whole Foods is great, but it's not, if we weren't in Whole Foods, I would still be ha happy, you know, being a Whole Foods just requires more work and stuff like that. So hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, no, I think, and, and um, we're unfortunately at time now, um, Thank you so much for everything. Um, there was one last question of is we could buy a pouch of the seeds. Yeah, damn, I don't have any seeds, but um, I don't have any seeds, but I can get you if whoever that is, they like send me an email. Uh, play, guess, I'm assuming you want to do it for the, this growing season though. Um, you, you can reach out to uh, True Love Seeds, um, True Love Seeds and, and Owen Taylor should have some, or you can connect with me if you're in the DC area after the season and I can, I'll have seeds I can give you once we harvest and stuff like that. That's great. We have someone who's going to go home and repot their fish pepper starts already. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, true love is sold out. Dang. Yeah. yeah. Baker Creek. Thank you, Kate. And everyone, thank you so much. Um, please fill out the survey um, that will pop up at the close of the program and come out. You can see a big panel of a Xavier at our exhibition, Food for the People, that will start this Saturday. We'll have a Zoom program from 1 to 2 p.m. right here at Anacostia Community Museum. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you next Thursday. And please hit up at Xavier um, on at all of his social media I put in the chat with Soulful. Yeah. Thanks, Sage, and thanks, Janelle and Smithsonian for having me. And uh, take it easy, everybody. Hey.